In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the early 15th century, there was a saint named Saint Hyacintha, who she was uh, born of a very wealthy family and knew a uh, sort of great f- fame, if you want to say politically, with her, her family, particularly from her father. Her father was a great military officer, and they had a lot of wealth, a lot of possessions, and a lot of renown. And this young girl uh, wanted to get married. She wanted to get married to a uh, particular young man that would elevate her status, that would make her even more uh, wealthy, make her even more well-known. And so she pursues this young man in marriage, but he ends up marrying her sister, which sort of completely devastates her, and she doesn't know what to do about that. So she decides, well, since I couldn't marry the man that I wanted to, I'm going to go and live in a monastery. But it's not the very pious idea that we might initially think. She goes into the monastery not renouncing any of her wealth, not renouncing any of her uh, possessions or anything like that. Uh, She goes in there and she lives a very comfortable lifestyle. And to top it all off, she joins the Franciscans, who at that time were extremely uh, known for their Uh, you know, asceticism and their poverty, and she's bringing all this stuff into her room, into her cell. She's living in this incredible comfort, and she's a great scandal to all of the sisters. Well, one day she falls very, very ill, and uh, she realizes that she's, this illness could actually kill her. And so they call the priest in, and the priest comes to give her holy viaticum, and whenever he comes into her room, he sees the drapes and the the gowns and everything, all of her possessions and all of her glory hanging everywhere, and he's, he's rather scandalized by this, and he says to her, you need to be detached from all of this, especially if you're nearing the end of your life. You need to let go of all of this, and you need to practice holy poverty according to your vows that you took. And she comments, Saint Hyacintha, she says that I was given a special grace at that moment. And the grace that I was given was not to get rid of all of my stuff, which that did come later, but that's not her point. She says the grace that I was given at that moment was to realize he was right. I realized he was right. And whenever I began that self-examination, that's when that conversion came and then she moved to to get rid of it. Because she could have been just totally offended by his correction, right? How could you say that? And, you know, maybe gotten rid of all of her stuff because someone didn't like her, right? Well, then that's no conversion. That's not, that's not really doing something because uh, she loved God or that she wanted to find some uh, sense of union with God. It was because she was upset that someone had uh, been upset with her. But that wasn't the case. I found her response to that correction incredibly insightful. She said, I realized he was right. Now, I want to use that example, that story, to take this gospel that we had this morning from a little bit of a different direction. We have the gospel where the Lord teaches his apostles how to give a fraternal correction, how to approach people who are in need of fraternal correction, who are in need to be corrected in love and charity and all that, right? And so he gives us a a list of steps to follow. Now, we always look at that and we say, okay, this is directed towards the person giving the correction, right? And rightly so, it makes sense. But I want to look at this from a different perspective. I want to look at this from the perspective of the person being corrected. Let's put ourselves in that person's shoes because how we respond to correction is going to tell us if we're in the right place to make corrections of others. An extremely important principle. 
How I respond to being corrected is going to indicate to me, am I ready, am I spiritually ready to give corrections to others? Because our Lord, in other places in the gospel, he seems to indicate that correction is the last thing you want to do, right? You know, what does the Lord tell the Pharisees who are so quick to correct everybody? He says, take the big fat plank out of your own eye before you go after the little splinter in your brother's eye. Yet in this passage, he's giving directions, he's giving instructions, step-by-step instructions on what to do to correct your brother. This is one of those paradoxes of Scripture, right? It's one of those things that seem, might seem like the Lord is contradicting himself, but in fact, he's not. In fact, he's giving us extremely important spiritual principles with which to follow so that we might reach sanctity. And within that is going to encompass everything. It's not just going to encompass one aspect or one particular function of the spiritual life. It's going to encompass everything. So looking at this from the perspective of the one being corrected, if I am receiving a correction from my brother, and I respond well to it, that says a lot about the person being corrected, right? It says that there's a certain piece of soul that that person is able to accept that correction. But how many of us feel peaceful after we've been corrected by someone, right? How many of us feel like, uh, oh yeah, that was, that was constructive, I really feel better about myself now that this person has come and given me a correction. No, that, that rarely happens. And that reveals a lot about ourselves. But I think we can take the lives of the saints. The saints, not only did they find correction from others, something that didn't disturb their, their peace, it brought them joy. Because A, either the correction was unjust, and they took it as an opportunity to grow in humility and to serve God, or they saw it as something as correct as in the case of St. Hyacintha, where she said, yeah, he's right, and it brings that person to conversion. We can always see this opportunity of correction as something beneficial. You know, there was the, the case of Mother Teresa. One time she was uh, just absolutely being braided by this person out on the street, for Lord only knows for what reason why you would yell at Mother Teresa, but this person was. And so he, he, was, he was just going after her. And, you know, Mother Teresa could have said, or any one of us would have said, you know, who do you think you are? You know, you know how many leper colonies I've started? You know how many people I've helped in my day? Uh, you know, and, and responded in a, in a very uh, defensive manner, right? No, that's not what Mother Teresa did. She didn't say a word. She let him have his little shouting episode, and then she said, okay, let's go see what we can do about it. She didn't lose her peace. Nothing changed, really. And that was unjust correction. You know, what happens to us whenever people come to us and their correction is, in fact, just? Because I can know one thing for certain. If I've lost my peace, when someone has given me a correction, if I feel all disturbed inside, like I, I go into my room later and imagine that I've been hit by a car and, and now I'm in a coma and don't they feel bad because you know of how horrible I, the situation that I'm in and I'm running through all of these scenarios in my mind about how horrible these people were for saying those things to me. If that's the disposition of my mind, of my heart, then that shows that I have not the humility to give corrections. I have not the humility to approach my brother and try to take the splinter out of his eye yet. St. Uh, Augustine actually talks about this. He says, if you, and from the other direction, he says, if you go to your brother and you give your brother a cor correction and he responds badly and that disturbs your peace, then again, that shows you were in no place to correct your brother yet. The wisdom of the saints, right? They help us to see the path that they chose that worked. The path of, of course, virtue. So whenever I correct my brother, it must be done. It must be done 
from a place of humility. It must spring from something very important. Number one, the humility to recognize that I'm no better than my brother. How difficult is it? Because a lot of times I think whenever we read this gospel passage, our thought is, well, I need to be an example. I need to be an example of virtue. I need to be constructive. I need to, to do these things for the purpose of uh, building up the relationship here. It's very difficult to say that. And it's not necessarily a bad thing to want to do that, but it's very difficult to say that. It's very difficult to do that without thinking myself better than that person. And that was the Lord's primary correction to the Pharisees. Stop thinking yourself better than others. You have that account where the Lord talks about the Pharisee who's standing in front of the tax collector and says, oh, thank you, Lord, for not making me like this tax collector. Thank you, Lord, for not making me like this sinful person. Thank you for making me virtuous. And then the tax collector behind him says, O oh Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the Lord says, it's the man who beat his breast and begged repentance and forgiveness from God. He is the one who walked away justified and not the former. Humility governs love. If I'm truly looking to be constructive in my relationships, if I'm truly looking to build them up, what must be my motivation is love, is that I want to bring the love of God. I want to love God more completely in this relationship. I want to love God more completely in this life through my neighbor, whether it's receiving a correction or whether it's giving a correction. And the only thing that will allow me to do that properly and effectively is the virtue of humility. The great saints of the church say that love is the foundational virtue. Love is the foundation of all the, all the other virtues, and humility is the foundation of love. Without, how can one truly love? How can one truly be seeking the good of someone else who has an arrogant, prideful heart? That's why in the spiritual life, probably the most difficult thing to purify, the most difficult thing to keep in check, is my motive. It's definitely something I have to ask. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And I can be sure that if I give a correction or if I receive a correction from someone else and I lose my peace inside here, there's something wrong in here. Even if the correction was unjust or the explosion of the other person was unjust, if I lose my peace in here, there's something wrong with me. Happiness is an inside job, they say. Happiness comes from within. And no one has the power to take my peace except the person I give it to. So today, as our Lord exhorts us to have that humble heart, to learn how to approach our neighbor, how to give correction, and also how to receive it, let's pray for humility and let's pray for the love of God to see our relationships bettered. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.